The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is the Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show can also be heard on KWTF in Bodega Bay, California, KOWA LP in Olympia, Washington, and WCRS LP in Columbus, Ohio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of this show, you're free to do so. Just uh, shoot us an email so we know you're out there. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, Care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week, we speak with an autonomous participant in CrimeThink about the work of that collective around elections, about their views on the recent election of Donald J. Trump as the president of the USA, voter turnout, anarchist perspectives on elections, democracy, and about building on-the-ground resistance to not only the new administration, but the autonomous far right that's attempting to emerge more and more these days. More from CrimeThink, uh, including their recent audio zines and the X Worker podcast, can be found at crimethink.com. Before the interview today, uh, I just want to say that as of today, Sunday, November 13th, it seems like there has been one thing on our minds since Tuesday. People have been expressing their rage at this election in many different ways around the U.S., the first four days saw protests ranging from less militant rallies to night marches, burning effigies, and highway shutdowns. Here in Asheville, there were four days' worth of protests, one of which rallied 150 people who blocked a major intersection in downtown for a good while and held its ground by the Vance Monument, built for the slave-owning KKK member Zebulon Vance, who was one of, the Ash- one of Asheville's so-called white founders. Moving forward will look like a lot of different things. Already we have seen at least three autonomously called for general strikes to occur around and on the inauguration on January 20th, and the amount of assemblies and strategy building infrastructure on the anarchist left is growing by leaps and bounds. If you are part of organizing and you do not see yourself represented elsewhere, please feel free to write to us at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or to William personally, that's me, uh, at stormwater at riseup.net with what you're doing, how it's going, and what you hope to see come out of it, and all that jazz. We will be happy to broadcast it or not broadcast it if you would prefer. Also, stay tuned to this and other audio projects for more ideas on how to engage. The Final Straw recently released the first half of the former Political Prisoners Panel discussion from the 2016 North American Anarchist Black Cross Conference in Denver as a podcast. That included introductions by former Black Liberation Army and Black Panther member Sekuo Kambui, who served 47 years in prison, former United Freedom Front militant Kazitore, former Earth Liberation Front member Daniel McGowan, and anti-fascist activist John Tucker, who is imprisoned as one of the Tinley Park Five. Check it out by visiting the final straw radio.noblogs.org and searching former political prisoner panel. And stay tuned for the second edition coming out soon. If you're listening on the radio and don't do podcasts, those will be coming up as episodes at some point soon. But first, some words from President elect anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? Going into Tuesday's election, I had no intention of conceding the results if I wasn't elected. As a write-in candidate for president, I planned to demand a hand count in order to get an accurate tally of the votes for me. Also, given that my Russian hacker friends Boris and Natasha have been compromising voter databases, I fully expected them to toss 20 states to me, as it should be. Of course, like everyone else in the universe, I expected Hillary Clinton to win. So I intended to declare myself president in exile and to exercise the powers of my office right from here. But it didn't work out that way. 
Donald Trump is going to be the next president of the United States. I think I'll concede the election after all. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm no Trump fan. The guy is a fascist sociopath. But he'll do a better job destroying the United States than I plan to do. So instead of declaring myself president in exile, I think I'll design a Trump calendar for 2017, one that has blank pages starting in the middle of July. Civilization won't last Civilization won't last six months with this wackadoodle calling the shots. In fact, even as the election results were coming in and the vote appeared to be swinging in Trump's favor, the Dow Jones lost 800 points and the S&P 500 dropped 5% before an artificial floor stopped it from dropping further. That means that the entire world outside of the United States knows that Donald Trump is a cataclysmic event. His election is an unnatural disaster. Everyone else in the world can recognize that American voters have given the most powerful office on the planet to the dumbest guy in the room. I think Trump's election validates everything that we anarchists have said about the poverty of electoral politics and democracy. I think his election proves what we've been saying about hierarchy being a pathology and what we've said about hierarchs being mentally ill. There's really no other reasonable explanation. By the analysis, Trump monopolized the uneducated white male vote. Bad news. Stupid white men rule the world. Good news. Stupid white men rule the world. I don't think this event should discourage anarchists. In fact, this is a fantastic development for a couple of reasons. First, I think the Trump vote wasn't ideologically motivated. That is, voters didn't vote for Trump because they agree with his philosophy of governance or his thoughtful principles. He doesn't have any. The vote for Trump was a general repudiation of the political class. Trump voters were rejecting not just Hillary Clinton and the Democrats, but rejecting the 17 Republicans that Trump defeated in the primaries as well, rejecting both parties and both philosophies of governance. In this sense, the American electorate has never been more anarchist, has never been more prepared to scrap government and the elite who run it. That's good news for anarchists. It just so happens that the symbol of their collective rage, the beneficiary of their raised middle finger to the establishment, happens to be a super fascist as dangerous as Hitler or Mussolini. The reason I say this election wasn't ideologically motivated is the fact that the only candidate that was more popular than Trump, the only one who could defeat Trump soundly, was a socialist. So if not for the Democratic Party stacking the deck against Bernie Sanders, he would be the president-elect. The second reason that anarchists shouldn't be discouraged is due to our certainty that Donald Trump is not the answer. The general electorate rejected the political class and won't go back to them. So what can we expect people to do when even their rogue anti-establishment hero betrays them? Yeah, fire and gasoline. As the intolerable situation that provoked voters to embrace Trump grows steadily more intolerable under his mismanagement, we can expect gun-owning, raging, and disillusioned former voters to wild out and revolt. It'll undoubtedly reach that level of discontent before there's recourse to another election before some other outsider can make empty promises. Empty promises that no one will believe anymore. Donald Trump's election signals the death of electoral politics, period. So, as anarchists, I suggest that we begin preparing to intervene in the impending outbreaks of public rage. As the Trump regime's failures drive people into the streets, when those folks get into the streets, they're going to need our experience and initiative to push insurrections to eventual systems failure. The global dumpster fire is coming. In fact, it's already lit. Hierarchs have accidentally brought their own system to the brink. Now it's up to us. The next couple of years are going to be huge. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from Warren Correctional in Lebanon, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain 243-205, Warren CI, P.O. Box 120, 5787 State Route 63, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. 
for updates on his situation, his bid for U.S. president in 2016, and more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org. We're speaking with a participant in the Crime Think X Workers Collective. Thanks a lot for taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you. So Crime Think is a nebulous and nefarious network of subversive free spirits. Uh, not that anarchists in the English-speaking world will likely be unaware of y'all's X work, but could you give us a rough sketch of the range of your work? Well, people probably have encountered the things that we do, like, you know, you're walking down the street and there's a poster, we paste it to the wall, uh, you know, saying the police are an undesirable force in our society, or, you know, you're in the library and you find a book uh, teaching you how to fight fascists or make wheat paste or, uh, you know, carry out, for example, engage in a black bloc protest at the inauguration of a president. Um, so Just hypothetically. We're best, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, we're best known for, you know, our publishing probably, but I think the best way to describe what we are and what we do is that we are a point of connection. Uh, we're a point of connection for anarchists and others in a variety of struggles to theorize what is uh, most likely to be effective in those struggles, to exchange experiences in the struggles, and then also a point of connection between uh, anarchists and people involved in social struggles and then everybody else, you know, to try to open those dialogues to all of the people who are not in them yet, but who have something con to contribute to them, you know? And I frame that question in terms of the English speaking world, but, um, but actually y'all have been engaging with and including folks in other parts of the world who aren't English speaking, which is pretty fascinating. I think like the range of y'all's reach. Well, I think it is important to be in dialogue with comrades from all around the world because sometimes something happens in one place and then later happens somewhere else. So, uh, for example, you know, if you look at the Occupy movement, Occupy Wall Street, something like that happened just a few months before that in Spain. And, and I thought it was really interesting that we were able to get perspective from the anarchists who participated in the 15M movement that year to, to tell us what their critiques of it were before Occupy happened. And we tried to pass that on to others in the English speaking world, you know, to just to, to sharpen our participation in that moment. So yeah, we, at one point or another, we've engaged with, uh, with people or, or people from different countries have participated in our project from, you know, at least, I don't know, uh, dozens, at least dozens of countries and, Crime Think material has appeared now in 30-something languages. That's awesome. Um, and Crime Think has a history of engaging with the electoral politics in the U.S., uh, though as an anarchist project, that engagement would look quite dissimilar to what other political strains might consider legitimate. Can you talk about that history of engagement and break down the widely accepted anarchist perspectives? I, mean, I, I feel weird stating it that way, but there's a generally assumed anarchist position towards democracy and towards elections. Would you break that down a little mm. bit? Mm. Okay. Well... Should I, to start with the activities that uh, Crime Think has engaged in around the elections, um, uh, I guess at least going back to 1996, we have generally taken a position against electoral or representative democracy. Um, in 2004, during the presidential campaign that year, we were part of a a broad anarchist project, the Don't Just Vote campaign, uh, emphasizing the virtues of direct action over, uh, over representational politics. 2008, we were part of the unconventional action uh, campaign to disrupt and reject both the Democratic and Republican uh, campaigns for, for president that year. And this past year, we've published a, a series trying to go deeper to, you know, to formulate a more systemic critique, a, a more radical critique in the sense of going to the roots of democracy, not just of representative democracy, not just of electoral politics, but of direct democracy, of all, all of the different things that appear under the, under the umbrella of democracy. Because, you know, many anarchists during Occupy, for example, in the 15M movement, other movements over the last, well, at least since the anti-globalization movement, have sort of presented 
anarchism, the idea that life is better without any authorities, as an extreme or unmediated version of democracy. This past year, engaging in dialogues with comrades who participated in the various directly democratic movements around the world over the last, let's say, six years, in different parts of the United States, like I said, Spain, Greece, Slovenia, Bosnia, Brazil, elsewhere, we, we wanted to formulate a, a critique of the shortcomings of this democratic framework, even when it uh, occurs unmediated direct basis on the scale, for example, of, you know, a, a hundred people occupying a plaza. Our basic argument in, in short is that majority rule is no more legitimate when it is uh, unmediated, you know, whether democracy is direct or, or goes through the electoral college. There's nothing necessarily right about something just because the majority of people want to do it. So, you know, if you are a person with a conscience like, like anyone, there's, there's nothing that, that should compel you to go along with, uh, you know, with the conclusions of the program of other people just because they outnumber you. So if, if you believe that there's something morally uh, right or essential about, uh, about the c democratic conclusions, that, you know, that would constrain you, for example, to accept slavery up to a certain point in, in U.S. history uh, and to accept a, a great many unconscionable things today. Now, five years ago, uh, people were really sanguine about direct democracy. They were really optimistic about this framework and they thought it was taking off, um, you know, and that this would be a way to make our case to society in general. Of course, we always try to be fighting the next war, as I, you know, as I've said before about this, rather than the last war. And, and so we, we set, set out to try to formulate a, a better understanding, a better critique of democracy and, and whether that could actually deliver what we want. Over the last three years, let's say, we've seen a lot of radical tactics and rhetorics and and strategies uh, appropriated by the right wing. You know, we saw the Occupy model appropriated in the Ukraine to overthrow the the government in the name of nationalism. There, um, we've seen these sort of popular movements that model appropriated in Germany as as Pegida, like a Islamophobic uh, popular movement. Also in Germany, we see nationalists trying to use feminist rhetoric to promote Islamophobia and also atheist rhetoric for that same purpose. I imagine that we are, you know, that we haven't seen the end of this yet. And democracy, I'm going to make the argument, has actually become itself something that the, the right wing is, is enthusiastic about, uh, starting with the Brexit vote, the far-right nationalist parties in many parts of Europe, including Netherlands and Germany, uh, made regular referendums a part of their, their platform. And so now, you know, we see that through democracy, uh, this execrable and terrifying uh, figure has come to power in the United States. Um, this is going to force a break, I think, between those who who believe that whatever is decided through the institutions is therefore legitimate and we have to go along with it. And those who recognize that you, you just can't stand by passively while atrocities and injustices are carried out, even if the majority of people are in favor of them, which, you know, in the case of U.S. democracy, uh, it's, it's definitely not a majority of the population that voted for Trump. Yeah, so something like 55% of those eligible to vote in the 2016 elections in the U.S. actually participated. Part of the non-participation maybe could be attributed to less polling stations year by year around the country, especially around populations of color, to changes in voter ID laws that chip away at protections enshrined in the voting, or supposedly enshrined in the Voting Rights Act, and to voter intimidation by so-called poll watcher vigilantes. Um, but the fact that a large part of the population considered both parties and candidates in the presidential in the presidential election, utterly repulsive, still stands. What uh, what would you like the folks in that forty five percent who didn't vote, who didn't choose one side or the other in the U.S. presidential elections? What would you like to say to them? And what roads do you think are are open to us moving forward? Huh. Well, there's an old slogan that I think goes back to Emma Goldman: "If voting could change anything, it would be illegal." Uh, I want to say that about not voting too. If not voting could change anything, it would be illegal, right? 
It's not voting or not voting that brings about social change. It's the things that we do. And I understand why other people are uh, now disillusioned with the electoral process. Um, I've been disillusioned with it since the early 1990s. I, I don't expect any good to come out of it, um, obviously. Uh, but the, the question really is how we can encounter each other in spaces that give us a sense of our collective power. Uh, that's something that some people have gotten a taste of uh, during Occupy, uh, during some of the protests in the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in Standing Rock um, most recently. Uh, but we are going to have to open spaces where people can come together across a lot of different lines and, and practice self-organization uh, and self-defense. You know, the, the institutions of the government are going to be used to make life more and more difficult. Uh, this, is, this is part of the strategy to, to stabilize capitalism in its, its final phases where there, there isn't enough abundance to keep expanding the number of people who are included, you know. Um, so instead, the, the fences are going to close off smaller and smaller spaces as gated communities of privilege. Uh, I want to say to the people who are, you know, the people who voted for Trump, he's not going to make your life better. You know, you, you, you are also going to get poorer and poorer. And eventually you are going to have to decide, do you identify with the police that are being used to violently suppress you? Or do you identify with the people who are in even worse positions than you? Because who is it that's going to take on those police with you if not the people who they were already targeting before they started targeting you, right? What we have to do together is figure out how to, how to meet our needs and solve our problems directly and, and collectively. And for, for, uh, if, if, uh, if anyone is listening to your show who still sort of has a soft spot for trying to get the institutions to fix the problems for us, you know, who still believes that we could somehow go back to the, the compromises of the 20th century. Um, I don't believe that, but I, I will say that in my experience and in my reading about social movements, uh, it, it always seems that the only way to have any leverage on, on the, the authorities is to be able to bring about the changes that you want to see directly. When, when that situation emerges, then they run after you, offering to compromise with you, offering to make the changes for you, you know, but, but until you have that kind of leverage, you can't expect anything out of, out of a politician. So building popular power and questioning democracy are two things that we've seen developing and that crime think is written about in, in the development of, uh, or the recent redevelopments in the alt-right or the autonomous white nationalist movements, um, but adopting autonomism, anti-democratic, and frequently anti-capitalist stances uh, uh -huh. to to basically say that uh, the population has been disaffected by industrial collapse or by the movement of jobs you know, across borders, taking up anti-globalization rhetoric. Um, and they, they seem to, as you pointed to in the Ukrainian position, play off of off of methods that have been developed in the left or the post-left, the anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalists, or you can see in the last few uh, years the adoption of like literally black bloc um, that was developed by Autonomen being adopted by French nationalists in you know uh, ultra Catholics and stuff to to repress Muslims, to repress women, to repress or attack people they could perceive to be homosexuals. Can you can you talk about the differences and similarities between anarchist perspectives and the alt right, or is it is it just a tactical likeness between the two? Or, well, first I want to say that we're always at a disadvantage, right? Because we always receive more repression than the extreme right. You know, um, the ELF was the number one terrorist organization on the FBI uh, watch list. Uh, when they didn't kill anyone, but uh, anti-abortion uh, people were, you know, had killed several people, right? So um, what happens as a consequence is that our movements go as far as they can go, and they, they hit a wall, partly because of intense repression, like I'm saying, and, and partly because of their own limitations. You know, for example, if we don't feel entitled to go beyond the limits imposed by direct democracy or by our 
lingering faith in institutions or the legal system. And when we reach that limit, then all of the innovations that we've produced are are fair game for for our opponents. The other, I mean, the other thing that the alt right has had in common with us over the last eight years, and this is significant, is that they have been able to understand themselves as being uh, the underdogs against the system, against the institutions. You know, we were against the uh, Obama administration, you know, and outraged at the way that, um, for example, you know, um, it was a two and a half million people were deported in the course of Obama's reign. Uh, you know, and at the same time, the alt-right could frame themselves as victims because Obama wasn't deporting enough people, you know. The interesting thing for me with Trump coming to power is how is this going to change the position of people in the alternative right? What are they What are they going to be the alternative to now? You know that you can't actually have the alternative in hegemonic power. Uh, thus far, I think that in some cases they've been able to play on some people's legitimate fear of government uh, oversight. You know, prying into our private lives. Um, you know, even even intensifying police control uh, to to make some rebels, some people who identify with anonymous or something, feel like the alt right could be cool. I think it's going to be very difficult for them to frame the alt right as cool. But to to say one more point about this, in, in a time when the shortfalls and shortcomings of democracy have been clearer and clearer, I can see how young people who have no access to radical ideas or who when they do encounter some sort of leftist idea they, they see that it doesn't answer their questions might be uh you know if they if they're privileged enough they might be vulnerable to you know to persuasion from the alt-right that you know alt-right people are the only ones who are talking about these uh forbidden subjects like the critique of democracy so from my perspective that's again a good argument for us to be formulating thoroughgoing critiques of, of what's going on in society so that young people who haven't taken a side yet don't end up reading Atlas Shrugged and next thing they know they're in a far-right black block or something, you know? And and it feels like engaging engaging the, uh, the existing alt-right is a really important thing at this point just to, to not give them the field of play. Like not yeah. only well, not only like countering narratives, but also countering countering in a physical way. Yes, absolutely. I mean, th- there's a lot of different kinds of space, you know, whether that's rhetorical space or physical space. Uh, they want to take all of it, and again, they have the advantage that the uh, institution, the institutional power, is going to be behind them now. But if their narrative is that they're underdogs, you know, they're like Ubermensch who are underdogs. Like that's going to be pretty easy to to undermine by showing that they are now just the autonomous arm of institutional power. You know, they're, they're precisely the same as the, as the ruling party. Now I have a theory that at this point in history, the state is going to be a a sort of a hot potato that whoever gets hold of the state isn't going to be able to hold onto it for very long because the, the state in a globalized world where the safety net of social democracy is being cut away, even in France and Sweden now, you know, the state is not going to be able to stabilize uh, people's lives in a, a increasingly like catastrophic capitalism. Uh, so whoever gets into power is, is not going to be able to hold on to it for very long. I, I imagine that by the end of four years, most people who... Uh, don't really know what they think right now will we'll know that they are not into Trump, you know, that they that he has not solved their problems either. He made a lot of promises. He basically promised to build a time machine and transport the white middle class back to 1950. And that's, you know, that's just not possible. You might be able to to preserve like a gated community for for some people, but you're not even going to be able to take all white people back to 1950, no matter what you do to everybody else. So my, my hope is that that he will be discredited but but my fear is that if we don't do really good organizing some of the people who currently don't know where they stand or or voted for him will go even further to the right if you follow me so we we really have to to mobilize we have to prevent them from from 
from taking space. We have to show that we are the autonomous movements from the base, you know, uh, so that if anybody is, is outraged and is looking to rebel, that, that they find us. Yeah, we, we have to do that un- uncompromisingly. And, and finally, if there are demographics that currently identify with Trump's basically white supremacist uh, program, but that are not comprised of people who are essentially committed to white supremacy and patriarchy, like we should engage them in, in dialogue so that they or their children end up like on our side of the barricades. The, the most effective means of struggle against uh, fascist, far right uh, and nationalist projects that react to neoliberalism, the most effective means is to, to provide real solutions for, for the people who tend to be caught up in those movements. And, and we need to do that too. And then there's the people that are going to be the focus, focus of the, the brunt. And that's already, you know, lists are already being compiled of, of assaults of various sorts against people, uh, whether they be what, what's sometimes called like sexual minorities or ethnic minorities or, or religious minorities or what have you all around the U S just the alt-right is, it seems newly emboldened, um, to yeah, act well, out. this is yeah. This is uh, the, the other thing. I mean, the the chief and primary thing that we need to do above all is organize uh, like groups and networks that can respond immediately to the the variety of different kinds of attacks that Trump's administration is going to be carrying out on on targeted targeted communities and individuals. You know, I mean, there really is not going to be an electoral solution for this. We're going to have to build some kind of autonomous, like power that we can, we can intervene, ideally prevent them from, from deporting and and imprisoning people. Yeah. But, uh, but I guess what I was getting at is that it's not only, oh no, no, that's okay. Uh, It's not only the administration. That's definitely a, a key point is that if, if they have their druthers and start rounding up people or can, I mean, not start rounding up people because that's what the federal government does anyway. But, uh, yeah. you know, rounding They've been up. they doing that since, you know, 1776. Built the borders. Yeah. Yes. Um, and just expanding and what have you. Anyway, but, um, but yeah, if they, if they're able to, to further that uh, and expand that action of, of deportations and raids, there's the official branch of it, but there is also this autonomous, autonomous branch of the reaction that I right. think that we need to organize again or continue doing organizing against. There's been active street resistance, uh, you know, against right wing groups in the U S that's been pretty, pretty spectacular over the last year and a half, two years. I mean, that I can think of resistance in Colombia, resistance in, uh, Anaheim resistance in Sacramento, tons of, yeah, tons of, in Georgia. Mountain. yeah, yeah. Um, that the, these autonomous networks have to, have to be able to not only, you know, resist the official, uh, you know, the official jackboots, but also the ones that are, that are literally quite afraid that they're going to lose whatever small bit of footing that they have, you know, so, so drawing people from those movements and saying like, look, this isn't the solution. This is just gonna, it's gonna end up, the train's gonna crash into you too. Here's the alternative. But also when they don't do that, physically stopping them and defending our our neighbors, our loved ones, our families. Right, well, I mean, until you defeat somebody who is trying to oppress and dominate you and other people, it's not possible to have a a heart to heart. You, You know, I mean, you actually have to, let's say, prevent bad behavior. Um, and it's definitely true that whatever autonomous right forces succeed in doing, that will, if, it, if they can do it enough, that will legitimize it enough that the authorities will then be able to, to follow up. Although it's, it's already hard to imagine how much more violence they could inflict on, on the black, brown, and, and poor than than they have been, you know? I mean, who knows how far things can go. Well, um, so within the last day or so, maybe two days, uh, Crime Think actually announced, along with a number of other on-signing groups, um, a call-out for uh, hashtag Disrupt J20, 
uh, around the inauguration in D.C. Is this something you'd be willing to talk about? Uh, what I can say is that uh, many uh, anarchists and other angry people of a variety of persuasions have already been talking about uh, disrupting the inauguration um, and just creating an atmosphere in which it's clear that that the divisions are uh, the, the, the divisions that, that rend uh, society in, in the United States are, are uh, you know, can't be, can't be covered over with, with some kind of, I think that, you know, Clinton and Obama both were talking about a peaceful transition of power. Um, for me, that, that just shows how complicit they are. It shows how complicit they are in perpetuating the, the violence that, that, you know, that, that their administrations oversaw and, and, and all the things they said that, you know, they said Trump can't come to power. He can't come to power. He's so terrible. And, and that now they're willing to hand it to him uh, just because for them as, as people who identify with the ruling class, I guess, the letting go of the, of the reins of coercion is just unthinkable. Um, for, the, for the rest of us, uh, we should show everyone who hasn't taken a position already in this struggle that, that they're going to have to, you know, that it's, that it's a, uh, that it's a fight that no one is going to be able to, to stand aside from and that, that you will either be, um, that if you, if you try to stand aside from it, that you're, that you're basically legitimizing all sorts of injustices that, that, that we won't stand for and that no one should stand for. Um, in terms of the organizing that is going into to this day, uh, I can't speak to that yet. I know that some people are planning to converge in Washington, D.C. Um, I imagine that other people are planning on organizing protests, demonstrations, walkouts all around the country, you know, and that really on the day that Trump comes to power, wherever you are, you should be able to to join others in in enacting the kind of uncontrollable and and horizontal grassroots movement that that it will take to to deal with the new situation we're facing in this country of having the the candidate the preferred candidate of the police and the FBI in power. Word. Do you have any Do you have any words to the folks that are currently taking the streets around the U.S. and cities from? L.A. through Milwaukee to Atlanta to New York that are blocking streets, setting fires, fighting back with the cops, making space? Yeah, I just want to express my, my deep gratitude, you know. And uh, I've heard from people all around the world asking what's going on in the United States, um, you know, concerned about what's going to happen happen next. Um, I mean, for, for people overseas also, they're like, how much worse could it get? You know, the United States is already this colonial imperial power, but um, but I think things are are coming to a head where it, it's a it's a make or break moment, you know. Um, so I, I'm very grateful for the people who are are risking their their freedom to 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 create ungovernable spaces at this moment. Um, for me, that that kind of activity it's a kind of care you know you, you are showing that you that you love and that you care for all of the people who will suffer at the hands of the trump regime just just as people have suffered at, at the hands of obama's regime um and and you're you're showing that that you want to find other people that you don't want to be in a society where people just carry their hopelessness around inside of them privately as things get worse and worse, but that you want to create open spaces where, where everyone can come together and where, where our heartbreak and, and our feelings of powerlessness can give away to a sense of our collective strength and, and, uh, and finally to us developing the capacity to, to take the resources that we need to defend ourselves from our oppressors and, and to to create the lives that we deserve on our own terms. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you very much, and good luck with everything you're doing. 
This is the Final Straw Radio. You've just heard us speaking with an autonomous participant in the Crime Think X Workers Collective about the work of that collective around elections, about their views on the recent election of Donald J. Trump as the president of the USA, voter turnout, anarchist perspectives on elections, democracy, and about building on the ground resistance to not only the new administration, but the autonomous far right that's attempting to emerge more and more these days. More from Crime Think, uh, including their recent audio zines and the Xworker podcast, can be found at crimethink.com. In this last portion of the episode, we'll be hearing two tracks from the newest Crushing Intolerance compilation by the Black Metal Alliance, which is a collection of metal artists promoting equal rights for all life. This comp is number four. First off, here's Arete with Beneath the Pond. Arete is melancholic mountain black metal from the Rocky Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, and the Black Hills. Finally, we'll hear Seeds and Barren Fields with The Epitaph of the Vain and the Forgotten. SIBF is a Swedish metal band. Money from the compilation Crushing Intolerance 4 goes to the Canadian and Swedish chapters of No One Is Illegal, a migrant justice movement rooted in anti-colonialist, anti-capitalist, ecological justice, indigenous self-determination, anti-occupation, and anti-oppressive communities.
You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show can also be heard on KWTF in Bodega Bay, California, KOWALP in Olympia, Washington, and WCRSLP in Columbus, Ohio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of this show, you're free to do so. Just uh, shoot us an email so we know you're out there. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, Care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.